Welcome to Christian Warrior Training. In this class, we're going to talk about report writing. Report writing is critical because you're going to use this to justify why you took the actions that you took. It's also going to help other people down the road follow up on whatever it is that you're investigating. It helps the church with liability. It is a very critical task, one that you're going to use more than my other classes, like use of force, even de-escalation training. It's going to be used even more than that. Report writing is something that you're going to do. Not a lot of, but enough that it's going to keep you busy. And we need to make sure that you're doing it right. This isn't a corporate report. This isn't a sales report. This is documenting either an incident or a crime. And there's a lot writing on it. So before we break it down, all of these classes are free. I will always make my training for free. It is for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to be the best at what you can do in protecting your church. Now, with that said, if you want to support what we're doing here, do it only if you could afford it. And you don't even have to do it if you can afford it. Do a paid subscription over at ChristianWarriorTraining.com. I put out information weekly. I put out the Church Crime Watch where we talk about church crimes that have occurred in the past week. I also talk about things that might help you make your church safer and some training topics that'll make you better at what you do. All right, let's get into it. Let's first talk a little bit about who I am. Why am I qualified to be talking to you in the first place? All right, first off, I was a cop for 30 years. I spent a third of my career in narcotics and special operations. What was special operations? A special operations is kind of like a street crimes unit, uh, basically California legalized crime, and they got rid. Of, most everybody got rid of their narcotics unit. Uh, so we still did narcotics, but we also did gangs and uh, street level violence stuff like that. In 2016, I was California's narcotics officer of the year. I'm pretty proud of that. Probably one of the biggest accomplishments I've had in my career. I was a SWAT team leader for 20 years. I left as the sniper team leader. I'm also what's called a drug recognition expert. It's a person that's identify somebody under the influence of drugs for drug driving cases. Uh, I had done that for 25 years, including going around the country and teaching DREs. My main job that I do every day is to teach law enforcement. So I teach cops all over the country each week, and I'm trying to bring that same level of training to you guys. I was a motor cop for a little while, field training officer. I worked in something called community policing, which is it was more like a problem-oriented policing team where we go into neighborhoods and deal with specific problems. Uh, the only inside job I've ever had, I was a training manager, and I did that solely to learn the ins and outs of the backside of training, the administrative side. I've, I've killed it with training people like you, but I need to understand the more administrative side of things. And I was a canine sergeant, too, and I just that was probably one of the most fun things I've done. Uh, right now, I own my own training company called Graves & Associates, where we have contracts with the Department of Defense. Uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy, and some others to go train law enforcement all over the country. All right, what are our objectives for this class? What are we going to learn? Uh, first, we're going to learn to develop clear and concise writing skills. We're going to talk about how to write the report, the mechanics of the report, and what you're going to include. We're going to talk about getting rid of jargon, and we're basically going to teach you how to write a report that could be understood by anybody. From judges to the media, yes, the media might see this, supervisors, whoever. We're going to talk about how to understand the importance of accurate and factual reporting. We're going to talk about how to accurately document incidents that you come across, including the who, what, when, where, why, and how, while avoiding personal opinions and, subject and subjective interpretations. We're going to master the structure and content of effective reports. So we're going to talk to you about how to organize that what voice to use, appropriate tense, and how to convey all of that information professionally. We're going to talk about recognizing the legal and practical implications of report writing. Your reports are going to be taken by other people, read, dissected. They're going to be read in court. There is nothing more stressful than walking into a courtroom, seeing 12 people in the defendant, and then your report is huge on big placards where everybody is reading every word that you wrote. And when you wrote that, you weren't thinking about that. But now you are because everybody is looking at it. Or one of your reports ends up in the press. Now, I know that your church may not release that report. That doesn't matter. It can still end up in the hands of the press anyways through court release or what have you. So you just want to be careful. And you don't have a choice not to document because if you don't document, it didn't happen. 
All right, before we get going even further and in getting into the main portion of the class, I'm going to put this all this whole PowerPoint onto courses.christianwarriortraining.com. If you're just watching on YouTube, head on over to courses.christianwarriortraining.com. You'll get a certificate, plus you get the downloads on top of that. So you might want to head over there. If you're already there in your dashboard, you'll see a section where you can download this and you can read this later on to come help you do whatever it is that you're doing. All right, so let's talk about why it is that we're doing these safety ministry reports. The big one is to state the facts of a crime. You want to outline if there was a crime, let's say there was a vandalism at the church. You want to write that there was stuff damaged, what the damage was, how much it cost, receipts for the repairs, and then photographs of the actual damage. That's going to be in your actual report. The police are going to write their own report, but never trust somebody else. It depends on where you live. Cops are great people, but they are fallible. That cop, you don't, you don't realize it, but that cop could have handled a major crime that day. He could have handled a murder. He could have handled a rape, a child abuse that's on his mind that's stressing him out. And then he goes to your church for a vandalism. The vandalism doesn't rate high on what he has to do that day. And so the work product from him, it may not be that great because his head is filled with this murder he just went to and how he's going to write that. And so he might knock yours out really quick and there might be some mistakes. People are infallible, all of us. So you're going to document it independent of what the police do. So that way, if something happens down the road, you can you can have a better a better product or the police might have a better product. You never know. But you want to make sure that you document it. It has to be documented. You want to uh, maybe you are a witness to a certain event. OK, so maybe somebody slipped and fell on ice. Right. So a good example is our church. We put out uh, ice melt. We put out signs and then we even go out into the parking lot and give people rides up to the front. And I remember vividly one time somebody was walking up and I remember one of the greeters saying, Hey, be careful. It's super icy. Let me come help you. And the person kept walking anyway, slipped and fell. That person might want to come out and file a tort against the church. You just want to document everything that occurred. We, we, we were doing these rides and document everything that was happening because when you go to court for that tort, that's going to happen like two years down the road. And who's going to remember a, a snowy, icy day? They're not going to remember all the things that we did. But if you write a report that lays all that out and then you do document that as a slip and fall type report, it lays out everything that you did. So when you, go, when you go to court, you reduce the liability of the church. Super important. You're going to write it to obtain a conviction. Somebody committed a crime at your church and you want to document what occurred because it's going to help get that conviction later on down the road. It is part of the investigative process. You're going to lay out the steps that you did to investigate this whole thing. A good example is we had a person come into our church, thought that our one of our ministers was possessed by the devil. She was on probation for child abuse, had a history of abusing children, and obviously had mental stability issues. We were dealing with her for weeks, and each time we got a little bit more piece of an information until finally we reached out to her probation officer to talk to her about keeping her away from the church because we were afraid she was going to stab the pastor, to be honest. And so part of that process was this lengthy investigative process where we laid out everything that occurred and we're documenting everything along the, along the lines that we did that. One of the most important yet often ignored aspects of our work is report writing. It is super important. So who's going to read your reports? Well, church administration, right? They're going to read it because they want to know what you're doing. And it's your chance to show your value. You're not going to be braggadocious inside of this report. You're not going to write unnecessary reports, but they are going to see your value because they're going to see the things that you prevent, investigated, and stopped. The police are going to read it. Now, you may give your report to the police. If you're a good report writer, you might want to give it to the police. So he can just cut and paste it in his report and make life a lot easier for him. Because remember, he's got a bunch of stuff going, or she has got a bunch of stuff going on that day. And yours is just one of the many crimes that they're doing. I have had incidents where other people have written reports, other professional organizations have written reports, and they're like, hey, we're done already. Here's the report. Man, thank you. You just made my life a lot easier. And it's more accurate because it's coming from you. Attorneys. Look, there's this thing called discovery. If your church gets sued... They're going to do something called discovery where they're going to say, we want to see all emails, all documents that are associated with this case. They're going to get everything. And that's going to include your report. Remember that incident I told you where you walk into court and then there's your report on these big poster boards out front? Really stressful. You want to make sure you got a good report that 
covers your church and covers you. The media. Look, man, when it goes to court and it gets t- your report gets taken through discovery, 100% the media is going to get a hold of that. And then they might print that in the paper. Your peers are going to read it because they're going to need to know what's going on. A good example is the incident with that lady that's stalking our one of our church pastors. In this incident, we put it up on a briefing board where everybody can read it and read everything about what's going on. So your peers need to know what's going on. And just about anybody you can think of, everybody's going to read this. Okay, You're going to want to control it. Your report shouldn't be read by people outside of the ministry, but that doesn't mean other people still aren't going to see it. So just know that whatever you write, what happens if it shows up in the newspaper? So let's look at this statement here. Okay, Doxycycline is primarily a bacteriostatic and is thought to exist and is thought to exert its antimicrobial effect by the inhibition of protein synthesis. Doxycycline is active against a wide range of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. None of us know what that means. Totally lost. I don't get it. Okay? I totally understand it. You guys are having a rough time here. You want to make sure that you write it so that the average person can understand it. You have to remember that writing of reports is not to entertain or to be creative. It's to communicate and maintain your records. It's going to be really easy for you to want to put in snide remarks, to point out laughable things. I mean, laughable, I mean, if it if it happened, you're going to document it in there, but you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to write it to show you're smarter than everybody else. Write it so that a high school graduate can read it. That's how I wrote all of my reports. So your reports provide a means for maintaining official records of events and incidents. So it includes actions that your security officers may have done or may been unable to do or simply failed to do. If you make a mistake, own up to it. Okay. I never, I've had to write a few reports where I've made a mistake. I own up to it and talk about what I did to rectify it. Safety team reports are important documents and that must be understood as representing official records of your church. It is an official document of your church. You're representing the church. Make sure that there is some kind of report approval process that somebody else is going to read it. It should go to the safety team leader. So the officer writes it. The safety team lead should approve it and and initial it, showing that they read it and approve it. If you're a safety team leader and you don't like what you read, take out a red pen and then start marking it up about not style, meaning like you don't like the style. We're talking facts. Then mark it up, send it back, have them rewrite it. And then it goes to the safety ministry leader or the safety ministry pastor who's going to read it to make sure we're good to go. And everybody along that line should have watched this class. All right, let's talk about note taking, about taking notes, because what you don't want is you don't wanna sit there and try to memorize everything that occurred and then go write it later. Go ahead, take notes, you can use your phone. Just know that there is a chance that if somebody finds out you were taking it on your phone, that they can get your, they could write a warrant to look into your phone, they could Try to get your phone records through discovery. Personally, I always use pen and paper. That way, if that way nobody could ever try and seize my phone in any manner to get any information. You want to maintain your privacy. So the information you collect is going to be used to refresh your memory and prepare that final written report. Okay. So how are we going to do that? I would just take a notepad and paper and just start writing. You want the date, time, and location of the incident. Time is super important. Try to just try to get a good as best measure of you can of exactly what time everything occurred at. Who witnesses were, suspects, victims, right? When you write down with witnesses and victims and even suspects, you want to write down their name, but also their address, phone number, and email address. I would also suggest you don't have to, but I would also suggest that you write down their date of birth and their driver's license number. That way we can find out who that person is. Not just if it's your church and you're in a small church. Oh, it's Jamie. Okay, I know lots of people in my church. I have no idea what their last name is. And I don't know what their address or phone number is. I only see them on Sundays. What happens if Jamie never comes back again? How are we going to find her? Okay, so you want to write down that that information as well. You want to write down what happened. You don't have to start writing your report right now. Just write some quick notes in an outline format about what occurred. Is there any evidence? We'll go back to that uh, incident we talked about with the vandalism. Let's say a teenager spray painted something in your bathroom and you caught the teenager. And let's say you're not going to call the police and you're just going to handle it within the church. 
In that case, what you need to do is take photos of the damage. That is evidence. Again, I would suggest not using your phone because again, now that makes it so your phone can be discovered. I would just use maybe the visual arts people at your church. Usually they have a camera that they can use and I would use them as like an evidence tech, right? We're not getting style points for this photo, but have them come in with the church camera and then take video or photo or whatever you're gonna do. Avoid, I'm not saying don't use your phone, really want to avoid it because there is a chance somebody can get it. Now, later on, if your church decides that we want to go get prosecution for it, but you already cleaned it up, well, you still have the evidence from that. You took photos, video, whatever it was. And then now the police, when they take it or the prosecutor takes it, now they can go ahead and and they have, they have the evidence that they need for it for court. Uh, if it's something more serious, like let's say a burglary, somebody broke into a car, uh, let's say there was an assault. Let's say there was a fist fight in the church and the cops showed up. There's going to be evidence, but the police are going to do the evidence, right? They're going to take whatever evidence that there's going to be. Let them take it, right? They need it more than you do, but you do want to take those photos and document what was taken, right? So you want to, if they took, um, let's say they took video from your video system, you want to make sure that you retain a copy as well uh, and give the police a copy, but you need a copy for yourself. Don't let them have the only original copy. And then again, that's evidence. So again, you're going to have to write quickly because things might be happening. Let's say it was an assault. And now the cops are here. You're going to want to document everything as quickly as you can. Make sure you get law enforcement's case number so you can refer back in your report to their incident number. I know they're writing it. You're going to have to write something too. You have to document what occurred. When you're writing your notes, you can use abbreviations and leave out unnecessary words like a and the. Uh, I, I use a common uh, symbol for suspect. Um, let's say we know, even if we name know who the suspect is, a simple triangle. In legal terms, that's defendant. So in my notes, I always wrote a triangle, meaning who the suspect was. So even if the suspect was Smith, it takes a long time to write Smith. I just wrote a triangle, you know, defendant, which again, triangle and legal, short legal ease means defendant. It made life a lot easier for me when I was note taking and I never used a and the any of those filler words. Every security officer on your team should be prepared to take some type of notes in the field. So give everybody a little, you know, it, it's a 50 cent. Go to the dollar store and get one of those notepads. Uh, you don't need anything fancy and always have a pen and notepad available when you're out working because you are gonna have to take notes. And write as much notes as you need because paper ultimately is cheap and make sure that your notes are legible. Okay. Now your notes, if you keep your notes, then other people can go ahead and take, take that part of discovery. So I never kept my notes ever. I destroyed my notes every time. How did I destroy them? I literally put it in a paper shredder every time and shred everything. Homicide and international drug cartel conspiracy. I shredded everything. I don't want, if it's not important. Everything from my notes was transferred into the report, not verbatim, but I don't want somebody looking at my notes in court and then examining it against my report and trying to find discrepancies in there. So just two cents, right? So one of the things that I like doing is as an incident unfolds and I'm taking action, sometimes I'm writing the report in my head about like why I took certain actions. Like literally it became a habit where a suspect showed pre-attack indicators and we're going to do a class on pre-attack indicators. Pre-attack indicators are things that people do before they assault you. Now it's not your job to take a punch. So as an example, guy drops his right foot back, balls his fist, gets an angry face and leans forward slightly. There are several pre-attack indicators in there that show you're about to get punched. When that happened in my mind, I literally, as I was pulling my baton out to strike the person, in my mind, I was thinking to myself, the suspect dropped his foot back. I'm literally thinking all this. These are all pre-attack indicators. And then I clobber the guy using that force necessary to stop him. Look at our use of force video to learn about use of force. And that helped me write a better report because I was thinking about it as I was taking actions. Um, I, I just started doing it. It becomes natural. You want to review your notes to be sure you covered all the elements that we've been talking about, who, what, when, where, how, why. And if an element is missing out of that, you're gonna to to be required to do some follow-up to go figure that out. All right, now we're gonna talk about opinion versus facts, and we're gonna talk about what a conclusion is. 
you are most normally not going to put opinions in a report. Sometimes you might though, but you have to label that as an opinion. So basically an opinion is a belief. It's normally subjective, meaning that it can vary based on a person's perspective, emotions, or individual understanding of something. A fact is a statement that's true and could be verified objectively or proven. So in other words, a fact is true and correct no matter what. Now, when I put in opinions, I would actually, in my report, I would actually have a label that said opinions. And in that opinion, I would list out, and it is an example, it, it, this was big with drug cases. I would stop what I thought was a drug courier. And I know this has nothing to do with church, but it gives you an idea, right? I, I can't really see in church scenarios where you would use an opinion for the most part. I mean, there are some incidents you might, but as an example, like I stopped a vehicle and I noticed that he had air fresheners all over the vehicle. I noticed, I asked him where he was coming from and he said, Los Angeles, I'm in the San Francisco Bay area. When I talked to him, he said that he took no luggage and was there less than 24 hours. These are indicators of drug smuggling. It's because they're using the air fresheners to hide the odor of the drugs within the vehicle. And normally when people take a trip, even overnight, they take a small bag with them. So next up, so I would put, next up, I asked the person if they had drugs in their vehicle and they said, no, I asked them if I could search and they said, yes. And then I found 10 kilos of cocaine in the vehicle. Okay, so it was my opinion and my training and experience that led me down this path of where I was going. And so there are some opinions. Is it a fact that drug runners will do these things? Well, yeah, we, we do know that. And we train cops that that's happening. But there's also some opinions in there as well. And I, I make sure that I label that out in there as well. Now, when we talk about investigative reports, we've got the who, right? And this is what you're going to be doing mainly is investigative reports. Who committed the crime? Who was the victim? Who are the witnesses? Who reported the incident? Meaning, who's the reporting party? Who came to you? And like, let's use like a battery. You can simply say like, I was standing my post at door number seven when Mary Beth came running out of the sanctuary yelling, they're hitting each other inside. Mary Beth is your RP. Make sure you document Mary Beth's last name, her address, phone number, email. It's good to get a DOB and driver's license as well. It's up if your church wants to do that or not. So then you went inside and then you saw Smith being beaten by Jones. Smith was on the ground and Jones was punching Smith while he was on the ground. You're going to want their names, addresses, all the same stuff, right? And then who are the witnesses? <laughs> the, in, the entire congregation, right? You want to grab some good people that were nearby. You don't need the names of all, like in our service, we could have hundreds of people. You don't want all, you know, 500 people that were in that service. You just want the people that were right there and just get their information. After you, of course, split up the fight and all that kind of stuff, right? Next up, what happened? And if there is any evidence that exists. Now, we already, in that incident, I already told you what occurred. Is there evidence? Yeah, there might be evidence from, everybody wants to take out their cell phone now and record the fight instead of stopping it. If somebody's got cell phone video, ask them to email it to you. Not your personal email address, the church email address. Because again, that's all discoverable. You might have video from within the church. That That's all going to be evidence. And then bruises on the person that was getting punched. Okay, that is great evidence. You want to take photos of that. You also want to take photos days after because that bruising is going to get worse. And as the bruising gets worse, you want to take photos of that as well. The police should be doing that, but just in case. And then when? When did the incident occur? Uh, when was it reported? Well, it, it occurred and was reported almost immediately, right? At the same time in that, in that battery, right? Or it could be, let's go back to our vandalism in the bathroom. It could be somebody who went to use the bathroom and they discovered that there was graffiti. Well, the graffiti wasn't there last night, but it is now. So there's like a 12 hour time frame that that occurred at. So you want to document that time frame from when the last person to see that nothing was wrong to when it was. And then also you might have, you know, have video evidence that would show all that as well. But timing is super important. Where did it occur? Right. Which it's always going to be at your church. But like us, we have four campuses. Which campus was it at? Was it at, uh, you know, however you name them. We name ours by uh, by city. You know, so which city was it in? And then where within the church? Like our church is huge. I mean, we, we have I don't know, maybe uh, I don't know exact numbers, but like maybe 2000 people over the weekend. And if we have 2000 people over the weekend, you know, you can see how big that church is. Where in the church it happened? It happened in the sanctuary, it happened in the kitchen, bathroom, outside in the parking lot. If so, 
which side, like the east parking lot, west parking lot, parking lot one, two, three, four, however you do it. I like taking Google Maps, a overhead photo if it's in a parking lot. I like taking Google Maps satellite view and then marking like actually which space it was in. So that way it helps out a little bit. And then the house. How did the incident or crime occur? Was the incident, how was the incident discovered? How were supervisors or staff notified? Now we kind of covered that in the very beginning when we talked about how Mary Beth came out to say they're fighting in the sanctuary. We can have the time, all that kind of stuff. What's good is if you have a dispatcher who's dispatching units, you're going to advise on the radio, hey, we have a battery in progress inside the sanctuary. It's good if you're the dispatcher and you're, you're monitoring the video and all that kind of stuff to just document what time that started at. Hopefully you got a timestamp on your, on your video too that would explain all that. And then lastly, why did it occur? You're going you're gonna to interview the people that were involved. And I always say like, why did you do it? Because he's cheating on my wife. He called me the F word. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is, document that. So the fundamental elements of your report. You got your initial information, which is, you know, you were notified of this crime and you responded. You're going to have your identification of the crime to include all elements of the crime. What's an element of a crime? So if you go read up, um, go look at your state's penal statutes. The important ones for you to look at as a church security officer is vandalism, burglary, theft, assault, stuff like that, violation of a court order, right? You're not going to investigate this like you're the police, but you certainly need to cover the church. If you Let's say you look at burglary. Burglary is going to have elements of a crime. When you read the section, it has to occur in a structure with four walls. And where I came from, it doesn't say anything about a roof, just four walls. So that would include a garage, a shed in your church parking lot, right? Something like that. It says they have to uh, go in to commit a felony or to steal something. Okay, so yes, our shed has four walls and a roof and they went in to steal something. We have, we've met the elements of the crime of burglary. Uh, but burglary is also to commit a crime. Example, a guy comes into your church to shoot somebody inside the church. Yeah, they came in for attempted murder. Hopefully it's attempted. Hopefully it doesn't go through. But you also have burglary, which a lot of people don't think about, right? Do you really need to know this? No, but it's it's nice for you to know for when you write your report to write the best report you can. You want to ID all of those involved parties, which we've talked about endlessly. You want to get victi victim and witness statements. Um, you just want to get just your job is not to be the police, but you do want to get some preliminary information about what occurred. You want to Crime scenes, you're not going to do any crime scene investigation. The police will, but you still want to document what you see. So that way you can cover it in your report. Any kind of property information. If like property was stolen, uh, let's say they break into that shed and they stole a bunch of Christmas gifts. Be as specific as possible. There were Nintendos, there were Xboxes, there were X mini Bibles, uh, what was stolen. And then document all of that so that we have a nice big list for the police when they come. And then what actions did you take? Just talk about what you did. It's going to be just a summary, just a written summary of what occurred. Okay, so you can see from my PowerPoint that I've written this for officers. There was some stuff I forgot to take out to make it for you guys. Uh, hopefully, you're not going to arrest anybody. We do have citizens arrests in almost every state, but you want to try to avoid that. You want the police to handle that. Uh, but how the security officer came to notice the arrestee which or the person, right? You were called there on the radio or you were just walking around the parking lot and you saw this man breaking into a car or one of the parking lot attendants came out and told you that somebody's breaking into a car. That's how it's going to, your report's going to start. And then what led you to stop and detain that person? A good example is that parking lot burglary. One of the, during your service, you're out in the parking lot and one of the parking lot attendants comes up to you and says, hey, there's a guy in a, there's a white guy with a black jacket and red pants wearing Air Jordan sneakers. And I saw him break a window and steal a laptop. So now it comes. Now you go into the parking lot and you see a guy matching that description to a T with a laptop in hand walking away. Why did you detain him? Because he matched the description perfectly to a T. There wasn't anything missing. You're going to document that. So the reader reads that and goes, you were told that the description, you saw a guy exactly matching that description and you detained him immediately. The reader would look at that and go, good work. Pretty obviously, that's the guy, right? Disrupting a church service. Go read your state's penal statutes, and you might find out there are specific statutes for disrupting a church service and read what it takes to disrupt a church service. 
let's say a bunch of anti-abortion protesters all of a sudden disrupt your church service. You know, why did you detain them? Because they were in violation of California Penal Code, whatever the section is for disrupting a church service in the 400s uh, somewhere, if I remember correctly. Uh, And then you go ahead and detain them. The date, time, and location, obviously, we can't hit that enough. And again, ID everybody involved, victims, suspects, witnesses, again, with that name, address, phone number, email address, if you can. It's kind of invasive, but it does help. Date of birth and driver's license number or ID number. So when you talk to victims and witnesses, it is going to be a looser form when you write down what they say for you. Now, for officers, they're going to have body-worn cameras. They're going to be taking a formal statement, tell me what occurred, and they might actually transcribe the actual interview that they have. You're not going to do that. You're just going to be very loose. It's just going to say, the witness told me he was sitting in the sanctuary when he saw the suspect run up and knock the victim to the ground. You don't have to get much more into it than that, right? It's going to be very kind of loose, just like that. When we talk about crime scene specifics, you're going to talk about uh, a detailed description of the scene upon your approach, including anything unusual and out of place. A good example would be that burglary in the parking lot. You were told, go, you know, you were told there was a burglary in progress. Somebody stole a laptop. When you approached the car, you saw broken glass on the ground and a broken window in this car. The car was a red Fiat with a license plate number of blah, 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 blah. It was parked on the north lot, you know, on this row. And then a Google map, I would do a aero, aerial view and mark specifically where you where it was. So count the number of spaces and then relate that to that overhead. So that way uh, you've got everything perfectly done. The police will love you for doing that. What were the weather and environmental conditions? Uh, sometimes if it doesn't matter, then don't worry about it. Um, but sometimes it it does matter depending on, on what it is. If for these incident reports on slip and falls, super important. Uh, you're going to want to document all that kind of stuff. I actually document in my slip and fall reports, I actually document what the temperature was, uh, that it was smooth, level concrete. I take a photo of the concrete to show it was smooth and level and what measures we took to, you know, to de-ice. Any evidence that you observe, its location, condition, or anything remarkable about the item that, that you took for evidence. Now, when it comes to evidence, again, the police should be taking evidence, not you. But I know some churches, I'll give an example. We had a burglary at my church. We knew who did it. It was a juvenile that went to our church that lived nearby. He broke into our coffee shop and would just make himself a coffee and then leave. And he did this for days until we figured out who it was. Now we're handling it within the church as it should. But what happens if things change and now we need to do prosecution? What happens if we decide he breaks in again and keeps doing it and now causes damage or something bad happens? Now we call the police. We're going to want to talk about those prior incidents. Were they reported in a crime report? In our case, I don't think they were. (laughs) and They should be, right? Uh, We're definitely not perfect. Uh, Just we're all fallible. So with that said, those prior incidents with him, we should, if there's evidence, make sure you take evidence. And the evidence in that case, all it's going to be is video surveillance evidence. But we're going to make sure we download it and then we're going to hold it somewhere. Um, I would just create a secure file that's like maybe in a locked filing cabinet in a locked room that only one person has access to any of that. Just so that way you, it's called chain of custody. Just to show your chain of custody is secure. Nobody else can get into that. You want to go ahead and create a written report about what you recover and document all that in some kind of a record. Now let's talk about your actions, security officer actions. What actions the security officer took to apprehend that person. Now let's say that guy stole the laptop. So they report to you that he took that laptop. He, You see the broken glass. You see the car was broken into. You see the guy matching the description to a T. And let's say the guy, the parking lot attendant even says, That's him right there. Go get him. And then you tell him, hey, church security, stop. And then he takes off running. And then you run after him and you tackle him. And and that's fine. There's no matter what anybody says, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would rather have the police do it so you don't get hurt because you are volunteering for all this. But, you know, if you go after him, then so be it. Right. Uh, God's protecting you anyways. Uh, Go ahead and you're going to document like what actions you took. Like it's not I saw him and I tackled him. It's. I saw the broken, they notified me, gave me this description, list it. I saw the broken glass en route to the crime. I saw the guy matching a description, not matching a description. He was wearing, I saw the man wearing 
and then describe exactly what he was wearing so the reader can see, yep, he's wearing, and he was carrying a laptop. He was wearing exactly what the other person was described as being wearing. I said, church, and in quotes, and ch- church security, stop. And he took off running because he's guilty. That's why he wants to get away. So you gave chase and you tackled him. And you could just say, I ran up behind him, uh, jumped. And as I connected with his body, I grabbed his waist and we both fell to the ground and I fell on top of him. I told him to stop and he stopped resisting. And then the police arrived. You want to document or be very descriptive of that uh, because you're going to have to justify what you're doing because excessive force applies to you too, right? People say, oh, the police are treated differently than regular people. Actually, we're not. You actually get, we get treated more harshly. There's actually more leeway for you with use of force than cops because we have training. Uh, But still, you can have excessive force. Now, if you tackle him and he says, I give up and you start punching him, I mean, that's battery and you're going to get arrested for that. Okay. So you go back and look at our use of force video where we talk about proportional force for what's occurring. Go ahead, tackle them, and then document everything that you did because you're justifying it. And also, most importantly, don't rely on the police to write the report. They're going to write a report, but you're writing a report in this incident to protect the church if that guy decides to come back and sue you later. And you don't want to rely on somebody else writing a report. As an example, as a cop, somebody else is writing a report. I'll give you an example. We had a double homicide and somebody else is writing that report, but me and my team are tasked with finding the suspect and we see him and we had to use a significant amount of force to take him into custody. When we did that, we caught, we sent him to the hospital because, well, he killed two people and he's armed. I'm not going to rely on somebody else to write my part of that report. I know they're going to document it and talk about how we took this murder suspect into custody, but I'm having my guys and, and, and not just like me writing it for my four people involved. No, every officer there is writing a report to say what they did and why they did it. And it's, again, to protect all of us. Never rely on somebody else to document. If you use force on somebody and then somebody else says, hey, I got this, I'll write the report. That's fine. You write a report too. It's called a supplemental report. You're going to write one too. So that way you can document what you did, not him justifying what you did. You've both got to do, both got to write this. Why you took the actions to apprehend the per- why the officer took the actions to apprehend the officer or apprehend the person. In this incident, he's got the laptop and he's walking away. I, as he ran away, I wanted to detain that person for the police so he could be arrested for the burglary. I also wanted to recover the property to return it to its owner. Very reasonable things, right? That's why you took the actions that you took and you need to document that and say why you did that. Let's talk about the value of reports. Now, reports provide the data needed to investigate and apprehend criminals and to solve crimes. Investigators and officers frequently use reports to refresh their memory before testifying in court. Trials and court hearings may occur months or years after the incident or the arrest. I can tell you, I have been called into court on things I wrote reports on. I have no independent recollection of the incident. I'm literally everything I know about that incident is from a report I wrote. To give you an example, I had an accident in a parking lot of an AMPM. It literally was somebody backed into a pedestrian. Apparently, when I wrote the report, I thought that the pedestrian was lying because I put in there an opinion and conclusion saying what the person that said he was hit by the car did not make sense with the physical evidence at the scene, and I detailed everything. I went to court three years later on a civil trial because the guy was suing the other person for thousands of dollars. When we went to court, I had no independent recollection of that incident. I was going off of everything, including my opinions and conclusions. And thankfully, the person who was getting sued, who was actually the victim in this, they, there was no crash. Uh, they came out successful and didn't have to give up any money. And it worked out really well. Now, a well-written report can make an officer, to op, security officer's testimony much more accurate and valuable. A poorly written or inaccurate report is going to create doubt in the mind of the jury as to the veracity or competence of that security officer. So make sure you write that good report. I'm going to give you samples of those reports. Uh, I'm going to find some and just put some generalized ones for you to read. They're going to be police reports though, okay? So yours may not be as detailed, but I'll give you an idea of what it is that you need to write. So let's talk about what reports can do for your church. Number one, it's going to provide a written record and an accessible memory bank of what occurred for your church to protect them. It's going to refresh your memory about the incident 
so that you can do further investigation later on or anything else that you need to do, but it's going to, it's going to remind you of what occurred. It's going to be a means of controlling communication throughout your ministry and any other agency or church that gets a hold of that. It's going to be a database of information for solving similar crimes. As an example, you could have that burglary guy running through with the laptop. Well, it turns out that that guy's been burglarizing churches throughout your area. And so when it breaks, let's say it wasn't your church, but you read in the paper the next day that this guy was arrested with a laptop, you can go, hey, we had similar incidents. You pull your reports, give it to the police, and the police go, that matches the description of our man, the MO, the modus operandi, it's him. And now they can go back and connect him to all your other burglaries. And they might be able to get a search warrant to go search his house and go look for your missing items to go help out the victims from your church. It's going to furnish a base of accurate statistical information on which decisions about resource allocation and policy can be based. As an example, if you have five slip and falls over the winter, that's telling you that you're doing something wrong and you need to work on your de-icing, right? So at the end of the year, you can write a report that says we've had five slip and falls. That's a lot. And so that should tell you we need to do some repairs at the church. We need to do we need to do something differently to prevent people from falling. Uh, it could be you have a bunch of burglaries occur. Let's say you have five burglaries that occurred over the year. We're going to have to put some resources into the parking lot to prevent these burglaries. It's going to aid in identifying criminal problem or behavioral patterns, which in turn is going to allow the development of intervention plans. So you're going to write these reports and it's going to show a common element of some of the crimes that are occurring that's going to help you reduce some of your resources. It's going to aid in assessing the effectiveness of personnel distribution and analyzing overall church operations. It's going to help you decide where to put all those church security officers, greeters, parking lot attendants, what have you. It's also going to help you with budget requests and justifications. There has been a lot of stuff that's come up, and I'll give an example. If you have an incident where somebody comes in and commits a crime, and you realize during your investigation that it wasn't caught on camera because your church doesn't have a camera in a critical area, then write that in the report. That way the church administration sees and goes, oh, yep, we should have a camera there because that camera that only costs $100 could have prevented $5,000 worth of stuff from being stolen. Or we could have identified the person to go get our property back, right? Um, that It does help a lot with that. And on a side note, I get a lot of budget requests and justifications from doing scenario-based training. Uh, you can see our scenario training guide. You can look at training that we've done in the past on how to do that. Uh, that shows a lot of our issues and we've gotten like, we got new radios. We got our own frequency and radios for everybody because our active shooter training showed that our radios were compromised. I mean, we've lots of good stuff have come out of that. It's going to give you good statistical information that can be contributed to local state and FBI crime databases. Uh, it's going to give you a tool for a church and carrying out its varied objectives. It could be, again, that slip and fall issue or uh, maybe an alarm for the church. It could be that you're using it to prosecute somebody. There's a misnomer that the police have to write a report to get a prosecution. I'll give me an example of that kid breaking in to the church again. Let's say he keeps doing it and we documented all that. We certainly, we should call the police but people don't realize I could actually take those reports and go to the prosecutor and then they could charge it based off of what we've done. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that because you should, the, the police need to have that information. So that way they, they, they may have more information to put in there like, hey, we've been dealing with that kid. And here's some more information for that. But just so you know that that's not always the case. The biggest one here, the number one reason that you're writing a report is to protect the church from liability. People are so happy. We have a very litigious society. I have been sued a number of times as a police officer, and they were all dumb. It's just people not just people not accepting that they did something wrong, and so they sue instead. You are doing it to protect your church from liability. A report that you write can keep your church from paying out hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could be spent on missions, on improving the church, or something else. All right, so let's talk about the basic writing elements of your report writing spelling and jargon okay uh you want to keep you want to make sure you have good spelling and you want to make sure you keep jargon out of it you want to make sure that you have good verb tense we're going to talk about passive and active voice we're going to talk about pronoun agreement we're going to talk about first and third person writing we're going to talk about gender neutrality we're going to talk about verbiage and legalese we're going to talk about accuracy conciseness and clarity we're going to go through all of it, but let's start off with spelling 
and jargon use. Now, when you're writing on a computer, most word processors have some kind of a spell check or grammar check that's automatically gonna underline whatever word that you're doing wrong, but it's not always accurate. Please, whatever you do, don't ask an AI like ChatGPT or some other large language model to write your report. It is not secure. It often hallucinates and gives bad information. You write it. I wouldn't even give it to the to the large language model, the AI. I wouldn't even give it to it to double check because what you're writing is a secure document. It now learns from what you wrote and it has all that information. So don't don't do that. Okay. Again, don't use jargon or slang. There's every occupation has some kind of jargon that they use. We want to avoid that. So some examples of jargon or slang that we might use in our reports based off just Christianity. We might say flock. No, you want to say church members. Again, you're writing this. Certainly people in your church will understand that. But remember, if other people read this report and they are not Christians or they're priesters, they only go during Easter and Christmas, they may not understand all the terms you're using. So instead of flock, use church members. Instead of shepherd, use pastor. Code four. A lot of retired cops will write code four, or will say code four, which is it's not the same in everywhere, but for the most part, it just means like we'll actually go like this to each other, which means I don't need help. Code four means I don't need help. Everybody go away. Um, don't write that in your report. Uh, when slang or jargon is used, it should only it should be only when the subject of the report has used these terms and you're quoting it directly. Is an example. Mary Beth came running out of the sanctuary, and said he's assaulting our shepherd. You would put that in quotes, what she said, and you would say, this means that our pastor was being assaulted, right? So a good example. So I do like this meme. It's been put out before. I want you to take a look at it and read it. It's misspelled according to research, Cambridge University, blah, blah, blah. You can read it. Um, You can go ahead and pause it and read it. Your misspelled words are very easy to miss as you're typing. So you're going to want to go back and reread it. If it's a super important report, have somebody double check it before you turn it in. And this is why we have people review it and approve it. Now, there's three major tenses, meaning verb tense, to be used in report writing. You got present, past, and future. You just want to make sure you use the proper one. I was standing at my post at door seven, monitoring church activity, when Smith walked up to me and said they were molested by the pastor three years ago, which that does happen and that could happen to you. You ask for specific, you say, well, can you tell me exactly what happened? Yes, back in 1999, pastor or whatever was my youth minister. And then you're talking about the past, right? You shouldn't be talking about the future too much. Active and passive voice construction. So active voice allows the reader to understand who did what to whom. So active voice, you stole the cookie from the cookie jar. Passive voice would be the cookie was stolen from the cookie jar. You just want to, usually you're going to be using some kind of passive voice for the most part, but you, you might use active voice as well. we got pronoun agreement. Pronouns are words that are used to take the place of or to refer back to nouns or some other pronoun. So good meme here. Name two pronouns. Who, me? All right. All right. This is really important. First versus third person writing. Okay. A lot of law enforcement agencies have traditionally instructed their new officers to draft reports using third person. However, you have to take ownership by using first person in your reports. I hate third person report writing. It doesn't make sense. That is 1950s era stuff. You want to use first person. There are still places that use third person. And I I, I don't understand why. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So basically, it's going to be I was standing post instead of this officer was standing post. That doesn't make sense. That There are a lot of people that write that, though. There are a lot of you that were taught that if you're a military police or something like that. That went out in the 50s, and people still use it. So first person, good one on the left here. On July 23rd, 2012, Officer Evans and I conducted a home contact at Mr. Fillmore's residence. Upon entering the residence, I noticed numerous probation violations. As Fillmore was putting his dog in the bathroom, I noticed he was fumbling with something which he placed in his pants pocket. I placed Mr. Fillmore in handcuffs, check for tightness, and double lock to prevent over-tightening. When we go to the third person, same date, officers of the division conducted 
A home contact at Fillmore's reported residence. Immediately upon entering the residence, the officers noticed numerous pocket knives. Okay, look. The officers, man, you're talking about yourself. I. I saw this. I saw him do that. I put him in handcuffs. I did whatever, right? Uh, just don't. That third person's horrible. Just stop. Here's another great meme. I don't always talk about myself in the third person, but when he does, I do. Right? It just doesn't make sense. All right, gender neutrality. There's only two genders, my friends, male and female, okay? Uh, all right, let's talk about gender neutrality. There is only two genders, no matter what. When you write, you want to use the right pronouns, we are not using Z, Zim, they, them. It is he, him, she, her. Police reports are written like this too. People don't get to make it up. I, I swear there are agencies and churches that are letting people choose their gender, or now it's even getting worse where they don't write a gender and they remain gender neutral throughout the entire report, no matter what in every report. Don't do that, okay, at all. It is confusing when it goes to court and it makes us look silly. And I can't believe I actually have to write this or actually talk about this. But again, there are churches that are doing this. There's only two genders. It is not political. It is documenting exactly what occurred by using the right pronoun. He, him, she, her. That's all there is. All right. So you want to get rid of that excessive verbiage and legalese. Okay. So reports have to be written in a clear manner. So it has to be clear, concise, accurate, and objectively written. So when writing in a passive voice, it's easy to use too many words or write in a confused or verbose manner. So you just want to keep it uh, nice and clear and keep out a lot of the unnecessary stuff. It, you don't get extra points for writing an extra long report. Okay, so an example of legalese, okay? The suspect entered the house by breaking the window and unlatching the lock. Clear writing, super easy to understand. Versus legalese, and people do this, the perpetrator used stealth to gain entry to the edifice. Deploying an implement to break the glass, thereby permitting the unlatching of the lock. That would be legalese. Don't do that, okay? It is, yeah, you don't get style points, my friends. All right, accuracy and factual statements. So you want to write about actual behavior. It has to be clearly worded, accurate facts about what is going on, who is present, what was observed, the actual facts. Don't add your personal opinions. If you do add personal opinions, you want to title it in a section that says opinions and conclusions. That would be the best way to do it. There are times that you're going to have to do that, but it's super rare. I want to say out of all the reports that I would write, I want to say less than 2% of my reports would have any kind of opinions and conclusions. You want to avoid using something like furtive gesture. He made a furtive gesture, right? So let's say somebody says, that man over there has a gun and he just told me he's going to shoot everybody in the church. So you run over there and you see a guy matching the description you laid out. He told me this is what he was wearing. You ran up there and you ran up there and you see he's, you would list out he's was wearing this, which shows he's clearly matching the suspect. He made a furtive gesture, so I tackled him and took him into custody and then called the police. No, I saw him raise his sweatshirt and reach down and reach down into his waistband. That's not a furtive gesture. He was said he was going to kill everybody in the church. And you saw him raise his sweatshirt and reach. So raising his sweatshirt while reaching into his waistband, right? So you tackled him because I felt that he was, you're describing all that. And I tackled him to prevent him from shooting me. Actually, you could probably shoot him. But so you tackled him to prevent him from shooting you. You handcuff him or detain him, however, which way you do it. And I found a handgun in his waistband confirming what you saw. There is a lot of people that would write that as he made a furtive gesture or something along those lines. No, man, you're spelling it out, right? Going back to your job is not to be a punching bag. Going back to them signaling the pre-attack indicators. He dropped his right foot back, clenched his fists, and then rolled his shoulders back, thrust his chest out, and tightened his face. These are pre-attack indicators. I was about to be punched. I tackled him to avoid being punched. Just avoid anything that's going to confuse the reader. Accuracy matters. I remember watching this newscast. I watched this newscast, and it was horrible to watch this on the news. The minute she said the first name, I was like, no. 
Like you could see it and it was, they got totally pranked. Let's watch real quick. We have new information now also on the plane crash. KTVU has just learned the names of the four pilots who were on board the flight. They are Captain Sum Ting Wong, We Tu Lo, Ho Li Fook, and Bang Ding Ao. The NTSB has confirmed these are the names of the pilots on board Flight 214 when it crashed. We are working to determine exactly what roles each of them played during the landing on Saturday. Investigators will be... Seriously, that really happened. I, I That was uh, for a crash that happened at San Francisco International. I remember watching all the newscasts about it because I was interested in the crash because I fly in and out of there all the time, or I did when I lived there, but then I decided to move back to the United States and now I'm in Idaho. But I remember watching that newscast. I remember watching that as she said it. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like, what what are you doing? Right. Accuracy matters. OK, so conciseness and clarity is the most important thing. So get to the point before I stop caring. A lot of people you're going to lose a lot of people if you're not concise and clear. OK, conciseness is related to an economy of words used in a report. So you shouldn't be super wordy in the construction of your report. Be mindful about writing long, unwieldy, and run-on sentences. They're not grammatically inaccurate, but also very hard to follow. So I remember a long time ago, a field training officer told me, your sentence should never have more than 15 words. And I was like, that's kind of, I've never heard that before. I mean, I'm, I like English. I'm very into English. And when he said that, I was like, hmm. And whenever I thought I had a run-on sentence where I'm like, I think this, this sentence is a little too long. I would count the number of words in the in the uh, in the sentence, and I was like, "Wow, I'm over 15." Every time, it turns out it was great words of advice. Jim Vestry, thanks for your advice. That was awesome. On the other hand, don't write in such an abbreviated or stilted fashion that sentences don't provide sufficient information to accurately convey the facts of the necessary elements of that crime or incident. So you want to make sure you just put in the right information you need. So the better the writing, the clearer the information will be conveyed. So clarity has to do with clear and concisely created sentences. Reading and writing go hand in hand. The more you read, the better your writing is going to become. So read as much as you can. I, I'm an avid reader. I read a lot of more, more than books. I read professional journals that have to do with stuff. And you can see it in my writing. When you look at um, the Christian Warrior Training bulletins that I put out, it's because I read a bunch and uh, you just become a better writer the more you read and the more you write. Never rely solely on a computer's grammar and spelling check. There is no shortcut to a real physical proofreading of your work. Proofread everything. People, as a sergeant, people would turn in their reports to me and I would read them. And I can tell you, I, be, I got tired of being a proofreader. Officers are turning in. I mean, I'd read 20, 20, 30 reports a day. And when I get these reports, I would give officers three errors. I would fix it for them. But if it went over three errors, I stopped and I return it to them and say, I'm not your proofreader. Go fix it. And I know they got mad at that, but I don't have time to proofread the reports. What I would do on the street is before I turned in a report, I would have somebody else read it before I turned it in if I thought it was a complicated report just to get a second set of eyes on it. And then I would turn it in. So that way my sergeant wasn't having to proofread everything for me or your team leader, whoever's going to read your reports. All right. So let's talk about quotations. Here's an effective one. Mr. Fletcher stated his wife was home when he got back from dinner. He added that B word kept running her mouth. So I stabbed her over and over to shut her the F up. Ineffective. I asked Mr. Fletcher where he was earlier that evening. And he said, Taco Bell. I asked what he did after his dinner. And he stated, went home. He later admitted stabbing his wife several times. That first one, a lot of, a lot of us that are Christian don't want to write that or even read it, right? When that particular word or what was said, but doesn't that convey what really happened with that stabbing? Very clear, right? So make sure you use those quotes appropriately. Again, you want to organize all that information. And again, they should be written in an organized manner from beginning to end. You're just going to write from what happened from the beginning all the way to the end. Write in a chronological order. A report should tell what happened in the order the events took place. You don't want to go back and forth. All the facts should be gathered and then listed in the order in which they happen. So on this date and time, I was standing post at door number one when a greeter came up and said she saw a suspicious person in the sanctuary. She said he was a white male wearing a black jacket that was full length down to his ankles. She thought he had a rifle because she saw a bulge the size of a rifle underneath the coat. 
She said he was sweating and appeared nervous. The temperature outside was 80 degrees and nobody else was wearing a jacket. I went into the sanctuary, saw the subject, right? Do you see how it's all being laid out in order? Somewhere, hopefully somebody called 911 and got the cops rolling. Even if people don't tell you stuff in a chronological order, then you're going to reorder it and then you're going to quote them later, but you're going to put it in your report as a chronological order. Okay, so let's talk about language selection. So good reports avoid wordiness by doing the following, using simple words, using an active voice, avoiding wordy phrases, avoiding redundancy. And you just want to be specific enough that it gives the reader a clear picture of what's going on. Now, let's talk about detail. Some people might say Smith was acting aggressively. How? Explain how this guy was aggressive. He was yelling profanities in the church, saying that the pastor was possessed by the devil. Doesn't that sound more clear than he was acting aggressively? Smith was being disruptive. How? He was screaming, the pastor is possessed by the devil. We must kill him now. Pretty clear, right? Smith reportedly punched Jones. You see, I've got a misspelling in there. Where? Where was he punched, right? Smith, I was told that Smith punched Jones in the face, right? Much more clear. If you're missing information, it's going to be used to infer that you are not very professional, you're not thorough, you don't have certain expertise, and you're not being truthful. The biggest thing is when you go on go to court, they're going to say, they're going to get you to admit that you wrote something wrong in your report. And then they're going to say, are you lying now or were you lying in your report? Well, they just gave you the option of either way, you're supposed to admit that you're lying and you weren't lying. You just missed something in your report. It happens to the best of us. You just want to try to avoid it. Some commonly used words that sound alike. So homonyms are two words that sound like each other, but have different meanings. English language is very complex. I think it's a category four language. Maybe it's category three. It's a difficult language for people to learn. Many people are going to make mistakes with them. I worked with a number of officers whose language primary language was not English, and they had a lot of issues with this in their report writing. So if you have uh, security officers on your team whose language primarily is not English, it's secondary to them, uh, they might have issues with this and you just want to double check it. So just be careful when you read and write these reports. So here is in this place, please come here versus here, meaning H-E-A-R, ear, right here is using your ears to listen. Capital, this has a few different meanings. One means a big letter in the alphabet. Capitol is the place where the government resides. The capital of the United States is Washington, D.C. You've got there, which is they plus R. They're from Canada or there, meaning it uh, belongs something that belongs to them. This is their car or there is that place. That park is over there. That there is going to be the biggest problem in your reports. And you've got to correct that because People will pick up on that and they will automatically start thinking that you're not literate enough to be writing this report. So just be careful. All right. So let's talk about preparing to write reports. Let's look at this video of an assault that happened in a church. To another Local 10 exclusive tonight, video of mayhem right in the middle of a church mass. A man can be seen here tackling a deacon right in front of the congregation. Nearly a dozen parishioners jumped in to try to stop that attacker. Let's go to Local 10 News reporter Andrew Perez, live now in Pompano Beach with this exclusive tonight. Andrew. Well, first things first, I wanna say that the deacon is okay. He actually got right back up and he finished the mass. But the most incredible part here is all the parishioners that ran up without hesitation, that acted quickly to stop this man. All of it caught on camera. Standing in court wearing a vest, Thomas Isell hears the charges. Charged one count of battery, disturbance of peace. You have an outstanding VOP. Police say he attacked a deacon in the middle of mass. It was a Saturday service here at St. Coleman Catholic Church. Deacon George LaBelle, pictured here, was on the floor giving a homily. Isell showed up alone and sat in the front. Parishioners reporting, though, something about his behavior seemed off. Just as Deacon LaBelle was wrapping up the homily, witnesses say Isell lunged at him, pushed him, wrestled him down into a pew. Approximately 10 people were needed to separate Isell from the victim and ultimately subdue him. Among those parishioners, an off-duty BSO lieutenant who said he'd seen Isell earlier and kept an eye on him, realizing something was off. The 28-year-old in jail is already on probation from Volusia County for battery on a person over 65 years of age. 
That surveillance video, by the way, just into our newsroom a short time ago. It's unclear exactly why ISIL attacked, but parishioners saying that he was pacing around, he was acting strangely, he's being evaluated, and he'll have to stay in jail to deal with those other charges as well. That's the latest here in Pompano Beach, though. I'm Andrew Perez, Local 10 News. All right, Andrew, thank you. We turn So when you look at that, how are you going to write that? So you got the evidence of that, which is going to be the actual videotape. And then let's say you're that, that lieutenant from BCSO. Uh, I think it's Broward County Sheriff's Office. If you're, let's say he was a security officer for the church and he was going to write that report, he's just going to list out what happened from beginning to end, grab that, um, the evidence, which is the video, and then hang on to all that. And then, of course, call the police, come arrest them. So we have different types of reports. You got a crime report, which is a formal document that law enforcement prepares, but you might do a crime report for your church because even if you want to do dual reports for what we talked about earlier, not to double talk about everything we've said already, but, and then the other is an incident report. This is kind of a broader uh, document that just is, you just want to document it to protect the church or for intelligence or something like that. Like as an example, the, the people that work in the parking lot have noticed a red Ford pickup, a 2012 that every day at 915 circles the parking lot and then leaves. It's obviously their casing, but we don't know why. That would be an incident report that you're going to document document that. You could have evidence as well. It could be the video of the parking lot that you want to pull that out. And then you want to give that to everybody. And then you want to call the police to tell them what's going on so they can come back at 915 the next Sunday and then pull them over, or find, find some reason to stop them, find out what's going on. All right. So five tips for writing reports efficiently. Use simple language. Stick to observable facts. Write in paragraphs. Use an active voice. Use bullet style. So wrapping it all up, as much as we all hate writing reports, it is one of the most important skills that you're going to have to master as a church security ministry officer. The consequences, if you fail to write a report, falsify a report, or write an inaccurate report is to get sued. You might get prosecuted, lose trust of your church and your colleagues. It's just unethical. That falsifying a report, I have had students of mine in law enforcement that have gone on after I've taught them report writing to go on and get arrested for writing a false report. I don't want that to happen to you. Okay. You're, you're, you may not get arrested for falsifying a report. It's just not right. So just be factual. And you want to remember that on the written page, being clear and concise is more important than being impressive, brilliant, literary, or academic. Again, write it at a high school graduate level, not a PhD level. That's what I've got for now. I hope you learned a lot in this class. I hope it helps you. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think of the class, how it helps you. And let me know what other training topics that you think are necessary for you to do a better job at what you do every day. That's all I've got for now. Remember your ABCs. Always be caring.